We're going to look at Samuel Taylor Coleridge today in our course in uh, the Romantic Epic. And uh, with Coleridge, we're looking at one of the great uh, thinkers of the early 19th century, a uh, major poet in his own right, uh, famous for having co-penned the lyrical ballads, which are a sort of manifesto for the Romantic era, it's published in 1798. Uh, but Coleridge is better known in general for his uh, critical acumen uh, as a writer on, on religion, on morals, on politics, uh, but above all, to my mind at least, on uh, literary matters, uh, so, and uh, to a great deal, um, to, at least to my mind, but that, to most people's minds, responsible for the estimation with which his friend uh, William Wordsworth was held um, so in his biographia literaria, which we're not going to look at here, but which I deal with elsewhere, I'll try and append a, a link to my discussion of that uh, in another context. Um, he argued that Wordsworth was one of the literary greats uh, that needed to be seen alongside of uh, Milton uh, and Shakespeare. Uh, so high praise indeed. And he measured that praise, however, with criticism of, of some of Wordsworth's uh, failings as a poet, and in particular his failings as a critic of his own work, which I think is to some degree what lent legitimacy to his praise of Wordsworth. So this was a just critic, uh, fair in his judgments. And I think his uh, when, we, when you read the biographia, you can see exactly why uh, Wordsworth uh, is the great poet that I believe he is as well, but at the same time is lacking in the areas that uh, Wordsworth um, was uh, arguing for his own case. And to some degree, these were failings in his whole metaphysical system. But we're not looking at Coleridge as the critic of Wordsworth today. We're going to look at Coleridge uh, in the light of what I said was the end of the course, namely the Romantic Epic and the epic uh, themes uh, insofar as they bear on the person and work of John Milton. And um, we're going to focus in particular on the poem Lamia, not Lamia, the poem Christabel. I've, I've, it's not a Freudian slip there, but it is to some degree going where I'm intending on going with this discussion of Christabel. Christabel is a sort of a Lamia figure, and I'm going to talk about what a Lamia is uh, or who Lamia was said to be, and uh, because I think in the figure of the of Geraldine, we have something of a Lamia figure, and in that we're going to reflect on the significance of why Coleridge is writing about this particular type of figure uh, and uh, its significance for the theme of romantic, uh, the romantic epic theme, progressive or not progressive, but certainly in Wordsworth's mind, as we saw last time, progressive. Very briefly about Coleridge, I don't, I think you can find this yourself very easily in any biography or short account, even on the internet, uh, born in 1772 and dies in 1834, <clears throat> a little older than uh, Wordsworth. He went to Jesus College, uh, Cambridge, so like he went to Cambridge, uh, he also left there without a degree. Uh, and uh, that in itself is also interesting. An enormously gifted uh, man who was revered uh, more after his death than during his life, but even uh, during his life was regarded as uh, he was the sort of lecturer that would fill all, uh, lecture halls and, uh, and would uh, speak in such terms that uh, the men uh, of... Uh, repute of their own day would gladly go and listen to him. So he was a sort of a public uh, spectacle in that sense. Um, but I don't want to waste my time talking about the man here. Uh, I'll, I can talk more about Coleridge in a course actually dedicated to Romanticism, which this is not. This is specifically focused on the Romantic epic. So we'll talk about Christabel and uh, what is going on with Christabel. Now, Christabel is an unfinished poem. And uh, I briefly want to comment on the uh, status of unfinished works in the Romantic era because uh, one notes when even looking at the greatest works of the period, 
that it is very common for them to be unfinished works. And when one notices that, it begs the question of why the writers of the era were incapable of finishing their works, and furthermore, why they published them as such. And the hypothesis which has come up in recent years, one that I think has some credibility, is that there is an intentional uh, failure to complete, which is marked to some degree by Coleridge's own incapacities to finish things. He speaks regularly of his indolence and, and so forth. And of course, he was plagued by a variety of uh, physical elements throughout his life and perhaps what we would call mental health uh, problems as well, as well as a, a painful uh, to him uh, opium addiction to laudanum, which he uh, struggled to kick his whole life, which brought him great shame. But nonetheless, the, the literary form of a, of a fragment uh, is believed by critics, and as I say, I count myself among them, to be intentional. And the intent of the fragment as a literary form is to invite the reader to imagine with his or her own minds where the poem would, be, would have gone had it been completed. And to that, in that incompletion, and in the uh, invitation to the reader to use his or her imagination, we're, we're bringing in the great value that the Romantics place on the imagination, which we've already seen with Mr. Wordsworth. And we will see through all, throughout the uh, writings of all of the writers of the Romantic period, a huge emphasis on the imagination. And it's not only the imagination of the poet then, however, it's also the imagination of the reader of the audience, in other words. And in this, we need to see that this was also a part of what Wordsworth was uh, suggesting as what constituted his uh, progress on Milton. Milton's epic was concluded. It had a very tight conclusion. It began with an invocation. It ended with Adam and Eve being sent uh, out of paradise with wandering steps and slow, um, walking their way out of Eden. So it's a very tight conclusion and a very finished work. But Wordsworth's uh, claims to uh, move beyond such certitudes as Milton's theology in favor of something that was here and now and uh, applicable to here and now. And what was applicable to here and now is the imagination of his audience, as well as his own imagination. That was a realm, a paradise that Wordsworth was ushering his audience into and inviting them to consider uh, that they uh, they themselves were the authors of their own stories, as it were. So there's a democratization uh, uh, that is uh, characteristic of the entire era, which comes along with the French Revolution and so forth, and does constitute a new sort of poetics and a new sort of theory of interpretation, for that matter. Because again, uh, in this very same era, we note a new species of uh, interpretation, which we call romantic hermeneutics, uh, most famously represented by the German author Friedrich uh, Schleiermacher, a contemporary uh, of uh, these English authors. And to some degree, uh, we can see an overlap in their interests and concerns. If you do study the German romantic uh, authors and compare and contrast them with the English, you can see that the German authors are uh, endeavoring and thinking on the same sorts of lines as the English authors. And I myself did a, my master's in English and German literature and looked at uh, this to some degree. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but I'm not dealing with the German literature here per se. Uh, I'm going to talk about Christabel. But it was an unfinished work, and my uh, I don't want to say it, it's with an absolute certitude, but I do think that there's a warrant for considering that the unfinished status of the poem had reasons that lay somewhat beyond those that Wordsworth or Coleridge himself discloses. And I'll read something of this. So this is from Table Talk. July 6th, 1833, he says that the reason of my not finishing Christabel is not that I don't know how to do it, for I have, as I always had, the whole plan entire from beginning to end in my mind, but I fear I could not carry on with equal success the execution of the idea. An extremely subtle and difficult one. So this is what he says that he simply couldn't, he couldn't, uh, 
uh, managed to do what he intended to do. So it, in that sense, it, he is something of a perfectionist. Uh, and thereby uh, that prevents him from achieving what he ought to have been able to uh, bring to completion because of his poetic powers. Uh, whether we believe that or not, uh, we, uh, friends and inter the reason I'm, I'm casting doubt on is that friends and acquaintances recorded various uh, in continuations and interpretations that they heard from Coleridge's own mouth that, that were at odds with what he just said there. So he said various things over the years. And whether one regards his assertions to be uh, authentic, legitimate, or to some degree to be um, uh, mischievous and casting um, uh, a degree of, of uh, uncertainty around the real motive, which is to get the reader to imagine for him or herself. Um, I, that's my contention here. Um, but we can leave that aside. Um, because that really deals with a, a broader matter, but it does deal with the matter, which I think is really important on this course, of what the basic challenge to the classical and Christian epic uh, themes and motifs is. And it's in this, uh, this precise matter that it invites the reader uh, into an imaginative activity that is a alleged to supersede the theological framework of Milton's uh, reconstitution of the classical framework. So it moves towards a secular and uh, imaginative and wholly contemporary and wholly secular framework of the mind married to the natural world or to nature, to use uh, uh, Wordsworth's phrase. But as far as the figure of the Lamia, uh, let me say something about this, <laughs> um, and I'll I'll get this from, uh, among other places, uh, Robert uh, von Ranke Graves or Robert Graves the Greek Myths. Uh, we can find it elsewhere as well. Uh, the Lamia says Graves uh, is uh, the 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 beautiful daughter of of Belus. Now Belus is a. Uh, um, the uh, king of Egypt, and his uh, wife was Libya, uh, possibly Belus's mother, um, uh, but she, she's the daughter of, of a king. And uh, uh, nonetheless, although he was a, an Egyptian king, by some accounts, and others in Libya, uh, the daughter was... was uh, eyed up and of course also ravished by Zeus. And I'll just read uh, Graves' account here. On whom, that is, the Lamia, uh, that is Lamia, on whom Zeus in acknowledgement of her favors bestowed the singular power of plucking out and re replacing her eyes at will. Very strange favor for his sexual um, indulgence. At any rate, she bore him several children, but all of them except Scylla, were killed by Hera in a fit of jealousy. Now, Scylla, Scylla is one of the two monsters that uh, uh, Odysseus had to uh, navigate through in order to get home in the Odyssey, Scylla and Charybdis. Uh, and so Scylla is one of the daughters of Lamia. Um, and Lamia took her revenge by destroying the children of others and behaved so cruelly that her face turned into a nightmarish mask. And later, she joined the company of the Empuse, lying with young men and sucking their blood while they slept. So all of these things uh, are associated with the Lamia or with Lamia. So Lamia is a, the daughter of a king. And, um, and for, to punish her, Zeus's wife, Hera, murdered her children. And as a consequence, Lamia, first of all, went mad. Secondly, stole babies from mothers more fortunate her, from, than her, not to raise them, but rather to consume them. And the wickedness of her revenge is so unprecedented that it disfigured her face, so she became hideous and, and moves from a child-eating monster into a sort of a bogey woman that was used by Greek mothers to terrify their children. And uh, there's also a further connotation uh, or implication that is picked up in, in various myths connected to her, that she is a succubus. So she 
uh, imposed herself on young men and uh, for, for um, in a sexual fashion and so forth. So there's elements of her being a child eating monster as well as a uh, figure that is uh, almost serpentine in her uh, abuse of young men. So there's all sorts of horrors here in uh, the portrait of the Lamia. Now, uh, let me get back here if I can find, what did I do with my vision here? Um, so with that said, um, one final thing, uh, and this is the main gist of um, why uh, Coleridge's Christabel is, is significant for the theme of the romantic epic. And it's just this, that in his portrait of Christabel, uh, although she is clearly an evil and super, supernatural being, so uh, in uh, line 239 of, of part one, she can't cross the threshold of the, of the castle because it has been blessed against evil spirits. And so she is clearly being portrayed by Coleridge as an evil spirit. Nonetheless, there are also indications that she's not entirely in control of her own actions. She is to some extent to be pitied. And to some extent, she also suffers uh, action. Uh, a, a sort of a possession herself. So we ought to pity the figure of evil herself. And so with that in mind, I think that there is something of the, of the um, something of the, how shall we say it? Um, uh, it's, it's the reading evil here. He is making us sympathetic to an evil figure because she too has a history. She too is not an, an agent of pure evil. She is also herself a sufferer of evil action. So to some degree, um, it's a tale of vicarious suffering um, that, that, uh, that Christabel herself um, undergoes, so, or, or rather Geraldine. Uh, so there's an element in which uh, Geraldine is a sympathetic figure and not just a demonic, uh, terrible figure. So that's the first point that I, I want to say is unique about this, is the treatment of evil. Now, if you compare and contrast that with Milton's portrait of evil in the form of the serpent, it's, it's clear that, uh, it, that Satan pities himself and he, he sees himself as this tragic actor. And he sees himself as having been uh, mistreated by God. Um, nonetheless, it's quite clear from Milton's vantage point that all of this uh, pleading uh, for, for sympathy is simply the regular actions of a tyrant. And we are in no ways to, to sympathize with the devil, although the, although the romantics in general did sympathize with um, Milton's portrait of Satan. But they do it particularly in their in their own treatment of evil. And so what they do with evil, and I said this last time in my discussion of, of Wordsworth's uh, prospectus to the excursion, is that they get rid of the notion of radical evil and the notion that there is a supernatural being, namely Satan, who uh, is to be identified with this uh, force that opposes God. Evil becomes uh, commodified uh, to some extent, uh, uh, normalized, simply by the portrait uh, of evil in this in in the works now that's in geraldine the effect on uh, christabel is interesting because and this is the second part of this poem which makes is particularly interesting there is a degree to which i think we can see that the figure of uh of christabel this beautiful daughter who is overcome by this lamia like figure is a figure of vicarious suffering. Founded on the notion that the virtuous of this world save the wicked. And so in that sense, it's a, it's a, a reflection on the atonement itself. She suffers, this beautiful, virtuous young woman for helping a, an evil figure and suffers for it. So in some sense, it's Coleridge's reflection on the key theme of Christian theology, namely the atonement uh, of Christ for the sins of the world. Now we're gonna see that 
regularly the romantics reflect on uh, suffering and evil in ways that are implicitly, not explicitly, but implicitly uh, reflecting on the significance of the atonement. And so those two things seem to me to be uh, connecting to the idea of the romantic epic. So I say that because Christabel is clearly not an epic. It's not written as an epic. It's not intended to be seen in the light of an epic. Nonetheless, it bears on the, th on the central themes of Milton's epic. And so I, I wanted to insert that into the course, even though it's only one lecture on it. And then reflect on how that relates to what we saw last time in Wordsworth's Prospectus to the Excursion. So let me begin with uh, a reading of some of the lines of the poem because it's brief enough to read uh, significant extracts. And I just wanna make a brief comment on the use of the meter, uh, which you will note is rather irregular, uh, irregular in terms of its uh, scansion, but it's not irregular if you understand what Coleridge is doing with the meter. Uh, and he explains that in the preface to uh, Christabel, which is that he uh, tries to use uh, a rather ancient form of meter, ancient in the sense that it was used in Anglo-Saxon poetry, uh, also in Greek and Roman poetry. He's using accentual meter rather than uh, in uh, syllabic meter. It, normally, English poetry works in terms of syllables. You can count the number of syllables, and that gives you the meter to some degree. Uh, the metrical feet can vary and so forth, but the, if you count uh, the syllables to some degree, you're getting close to the meter of the poem. We find that in Christabel that is not so. Uh, the line length varies quite significantly, yet Coleridge notes in each line there are only four accents, and that makes it regular. And so when you're reading the poem, as I shall do now, listen for the four accents within each line. In the short lines, they're obviously uh, lining up more or less with uh, the syllables, but in the lengthier lines, you'll see that it is more obviously accentual. And so what we notice here is that Coleridge is a brilliant versifier, just as I believe Wordsworth is, and some of the other poets are as well. These are This is why the Romantics are great poets. I happen to not think that their um, development of the epic uh, subject matter is great. I think that the romantic uh, aesthetic and the idea that the imagination can replace uh, the truths of, of heroism of the classical world and the Christian uh, subversion of that through the heroism of Jesus Christ uh, is, is to some degree absurd and bankrupt. But I do think, nonetheless, that they're brilliant poets and in seen in the light of the great tradition of English literature, um, they ought to be uh, recognized and acknowledged and read uh, as great poets. And that's largely because of their capacities as versifiers as well as uh, for their engagement in um, uh, with the works of the past in creative and interesting ways. But this poem was loved by the other romantics. It's one, it was loved by Lord Byron, it was loved by uh, Sir Walter Scott, uh, and, uh, and, and the second generation of romantics, and it was very influential on Keats uh, in his poem Lamia, uh, which we will read at the end of this course. But without further ado, let me get into the poem uh, properly with a little bit of a reading of it. So he begins, part one. Tis the middle of night by the castle clock, and the owls have awakened the crowing cock, to wit, to woo, and hark again the crowing cock, how drowsily it crew. Sir Leoline, the baron rich, hath a toothless mastiff bitch. From her kennel beneath the rock she maketh answer to the clock. Four for the quarters and twelve for the hour, ever and I by shine and shower. Sixteen short howls, not over loud. Some say she sees my lady's shroud. Is the night chilly and dark? The night is chilly, but not dark. The thin gray cloud is spread on high. It covers, but not hides the sky. The moon is behind and at the full, and yet she looks both small and dull. The night is chill, the cloud is gray, tis a month before the month of May, and the spring comes slowly up this way. The lovely lady, Christabel, whom her father loves so well, what makes her in the wood so late? 
a furlong from the castle gate. She had dreams all yesternight of her own betrothed night, and she in the midnight wood will pray for the wheel of her lover that's far away. She stole along, she nothing spoke, the sighs she heaved were soft and low, and naught was green upon the oak but moss and rarest mistletoe. She kneels beneath the huge oak tree, and in silence prayeth she. The lady sprung up suddenly, the lovely lady, Christabel. It moaned as near, as near can be, for what it is she cannot tell. On the other side, it seems to be a huge, broad-breasted old oak tree. Let me stop there briefly and say a few words. It occurs to me, and I should have mentioned, the name Christabel uh, has at least allusions to two uh, things, Christ obviously being the one. Uh, the other is Bel. Bel is a uh, name of, of, of a pagan god in the ancient world. And to some degree, I wonder whether Coleridge is uh, in his uh, this period of his life when he's writing, when he was thinking of becoming a, a Unitarian minister, when his uh, thinking was rather uh, heterodox, to put it mildly, um, as a Unitarian, thinking that all religions are more or less one, whether he is in fact fusing uh, Christian ideas with those of uh, uh, demonic uh, religious powers. And I think that is actually what is going on in the poem. It is very clearly touching on themes and ideas of evil and the encounters with it. And we see it here in the passage with which I concluded, when she goes to pray, having had this dream about uh, uh, her own betrothed night, this, uh, she prays, uh, beneath a huge oak tree. Now, oak trees are uh, typically uh, in the uh, religions, the ancient pagan religions of, um, of Britain, but also throughout uh, Europe associated with, with pagan deities. And so she's praying underneath an old, uh, old oak tree and also uh, um, near mistletoe, which again is a pagan. So it's a, she's clearly, um, exercising a pagan sort of religious rite. And as she prays, uh, she springs up because something has happened. Now, what happens? Well, it moaned as near. And the it, the reference here is unclear. It's mysterious. And quite frankly, it's very spooky because of that. I think it's brilliantly done by Coleridge. The it that mo moaned, what exactly is this? And we don't know. And she doesn't know either for what it is she cannot tell. And then we get the hyphen here in the poem, which again, the hyphenated, uh, the use of the hyphen or the long dash in, in colors, just as it was with Wordsworth, suggests the sublime. I'll say that to you regularly, the use of the hyphen or the long dash in Wordsworth's poetry, as it is in other poets of the period, has a particular function and it's to evoke the mystery and the terror of the sublime. It's regularly so in words with, it is so here as well. It, it, it is to not just to punctuate, it's to suggest something more here. And that it, what it suggests is the incursion of something evil into the person of Christabel. And it's on the other side, the other side of what? Well, it's on the other side of the tree, but the, but the reference here is a little bit vague and intentionally so. That's part of the sublimity of it. It's on the other side, the other side of what? On the other side of the tree, perhaps, on the other side of um, the, the, the threshold between good and evil, possibly as well. Again, the, refer the vague reference serves Coleridge's purposes of evo evoking suspense and, and terror in the reader. It, but it's on the other side of the huge, broad-breasted old oak tree. Now, the, even the tree is referred to have breasts here. There's something a, a, a feminine in the description of the tree, which, which Coleridge is, of course, intentionally evoking because he is feminizing uh, a variety of things here, including the, the personification of evil in the form of what will be the it that we are about to be introduced to. But I will now read on. Line 43. The night is chill, the forest bare. Is it the wind that moaneth bleak? 
There is not wind enough in the air to move away the ringlet curl from the lovely lady's cheek. Long dash. There is not wind enough to twirl the one red leaf, the last of its clan, that dances as often as dance it can, hanging so light and hanging so high on the topmost twig that looks up at the sky. Hush, beating heart of Christabel. Jesu, Maria, shield her well. She folded her arms beneath her cloak and stole to the other side of the oak. What sees she there? There she sees a damsel bright, dressed in a silken robe of white that shadowy in the moonlight shone, the neck that made that white robe wan, her stately neck, the arms were bare, her blue veined feet unsandaled were, and wildly glittered here and there the gems entangled in her hair. I guess twas frightful there to see a lady so richly clad as she, beautiful exceedingly. Mary, mother, save me now, said Christabel, and who art thou? Stop very briefly there. Note the incursion into the poem of the poet's voice here to add again to the suspense and terror of the scene. The poet is, uh, inserts himself, breaks through the wall between the reader and the text, and makes us aware of the uh, the distress of the poet himself, and thereby makes us aware of the presence of the author, of course, but also of ourselves uh, in reading this. It, 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 it breaks the narrative up and makes us think about ourselves as well as simply what we're reading. Now, this is a, a device of disclosure on the poet's part that invites us to a sort of a hermeneutic response to the text. And, and Coleridge is brilliant at this and is well aware of what he's doing when he does this. Now it's not uh, only the romantics do, that do this sort of thing. Virgil himself does this at various points in, in his work and even Homer for that matter, if you think back to the Odyssey, when he praises the swineherd Eumaeus, he speaks to him as my swineherd and you, oh, Eumaeus, and so forth. So the insertion of the poet into the uh, context of the narrative, the dramatic poetic narrative, is something, a poetic device that poets use uh, for certain purposes. But here it's to express uh, the poet's horror at what he sees, and he invokes Jesus and Maria. So he's using uh, more uh, self-consciously Catholic and to some degree, thereby medieval connotations here. So the, the sort of medieval backdrop here of the poem, which is characteristic again of the Gothic uh, coloring in the uh, Enlightenment period that is very commonly loved by the Romantics, is part of uh, the uh, intention of bringing some sort of a, uh, an awareness that there's a religious uh, issue here and a spiritual threat. And, and Coleridge brought, brings our attention to this if we were in any doubts about what is going on here. Uh, so I will continue. So Christabel, the question was, and who art thou? Line 71. The lady strange made answer meet, and her voice was faint and sweet. Have pity on my sore distress. I scarce can speak for weariness. Stretch forth thy hand. And have no fear, said Christabel. How camest thou here? And the lady, whose voice was faint and sweet, didst thus pursue her answer meet. My sire is of a noble line, and my name is Geraldine. Five warriors seized me yestermorn, me, even me, a maid forlorn. They choked my cries with force and fright, and tied me on a palfrey white. The palfrey was as fleet as wind, and they rode furiously behind. They spurred amain, their steeds were white, and once we crossed the shade of night. As sure as heaven shall rescue me, I have no thought what men they be, nor do I know how long it is, for I have lain entranced, I wis, since one, the tallest of the five, took me from the palfrey's back, a weary woman, scarce alive. Some muttered words his comrades spoke. He placed me underneath this oak. He swore they would return with haste. Whither they went, I cannot tell. I thought I heard some minutes past sounds as of a castle bell. Stretch forth thy hand. Thus ended she, and help a wretched maid 
to flee. <coughs> Comic here. So the uh, the tale that uh, Geraldine, the uh, woman on the other side of the oak tree, tells to her is one of of suffering and of abuse, and of um, of trauma. And if we think about the uh, allusion to the uh, Lamia that I read at the outset, uh, Lamia, who is herself a, a terrible monster, a disfigured uh, figure, uh, and a female one, was once herself beautiful and suffered for it. And, and it, Coleridge is introducing that idea of an abused individual who's nonetheless thought to be evil here and making us nonetheless more sympathetic with the figure than we would otherwise. Now, in that sense, he is bearing upon, uh, as I say, the, the themes of good and evil that Milton himself raises in Paradise Lost. And the fact that what uh, Coleridge adds to it is he adds the serpentine nature to her. She's half woman and half serpent. We'll come to that in a minute. But that's why I say there's a connection with Paradise Lost, because he doesn't just connect it with a Lamia figure, namely a female, but also with the serpent. Um, but he, he, so she's weary and she's, but she's placed, in it, so she's a victim. She, she casts herself as a victim here and asks for her hand to be stretched forth in sympathy. And of course, uh, Christabel being the lovely young woman that she is and compassionate does exactly that line 104 then Christabel stretched forth her hand and comforted fair Geraldine oh well bright dame may you command the service of Sir Leoline and gladly our stout chivalry will he send forth and friends with all to guide and guard you safe and free home to your no father's noble hall she rose, and forth with steps they passed, that strove to be, and were not, fast. Her gracious stars the lady blessed, and thus spake on sweet Christabel. All our household are at rest, the hall is silent as the cell. Sir Leoline is weak in health, and may not well awaken be, but we will move as if in stealth. And I beseech your courtesy this night, to share your couch with me. So in addition to the uh, uh, notion of being a victim here, there's an element of sexual um, uh, intimation here or insinuation at any rate. She asks in addition for her assistance that she share her couch with her and says that they ought to move in stealth. So already there is a, a, a moral overtones cast upon the speech of this uh, allegedly victimized uh, Geraldine, which ought to raise the uh, fears uh, of the reader. At any rate, line 123, they crossed the moat and Christabel took the key that fitted well. A little door she opened straight, all in the middle of the gate, the gate that was ironed within and without, where an army in battle array had marched out. The lady sank, but like through pain, and Christabel with might and main lifted her up, a weary weight over the threshold of the gate. Then the lady rose again and moved as she were not in pain. So the thing I referenced at the outset, the, that this uh, spirit cannot cross over the threshold of the castle unbidden or unaccompanied. And, and this is exactly what um, Christabel does as she carries her over the threshold. And we see a similar sort of thing if you want to go to Faust um, or Dr. Faustus or any, um, the idea that, that evil spirits are, are to some degree um, kept outside of um, the uh, residence of, of uh, blessed places, places where Christians dwell, unless they are, uh, invited in. And that's precisely what happens here. So under the guise of, uh, <clears throat> and with with Christabel's pity, uh, the allegedly victimized uh, Geraldine comes into the castle. So it's by appealing to her compassion, she gets in. So, it, so there's something seductive, uh, but also uh, deceptive about the lady's speech, which is if we're, if we're attentive to Milton's Paradise Lost, is characteristic of Satan himself. 
Um, and we get nothing like that in the portrait of the, of the Lamia in the ancient world. So uh, although the Lamia is clearly a figure that's being alluded to here by Coleridge, we, he's amplifying it by saying that it's in addition to her demonic activities of eating children and being a succubus to young men, she is also deceptive in her speech and evil in her intention. So there's, a, there's an element of her, uh, of her character in addition to her actions, which he is reflecting upon. So back we, back we go. So they've crossed the threshold, line 135. So free from danger, free from fear, they crossed the court, right glad they were, and Christabel, Christabel devoutly cried to the lady by her side, Praise we the Virgin, all divine, who hath rescued thee from thy distress. Alas, alas, said Geraldine, I cannot speak for weariness. So free from danger, free from fear, they crossed the court, right glad they were. So another hint that there's something amiss here. The uh, Geraldine refuses to pray to the Virgin, all divine. And at that point, we move to a seemingly incidental, uh, insignificant character, one, however, that is uh, re referred to uh, throughout the account, the, the Mastiff that's lying there, uh, referred to right at the outset of the poem. Uh, functions in the same way that uh, Odysseus's old dog Argos does as a device of disclosure, revealing the nature of who has entered the keep here. In, in, uh, in the Odyssey, in that account, uh, the old dog Argos, who has not seen his master in 20 years, perks his head up and wags his tail when he sees Odysseus come home. He recognizes him and to some degree uh, threatens to give him away, although I don't think the threat's very significant because only Odysseus himself recognizes the old dog has recognized him and then the old dog dies. Here the dog recognizes not his master but the presence of evil and how does he do that? Well outside her kennel the mastiff old lay fast asleep in moonshine cold. The mastiff old did not awake yet, sh yet she an angry moan, moan did make. And what can ail the masked bitch? Never till now she uttered yell beneath the eye of Christabel. Perhaps it is the owlet's scritch, for what can ail the mastiff bitch? We know, the reader knows. So there's an element here of, uh, of irony in the account here, whereby the reader is aware of more uh, than the uh, figure in the narrative. So there's a discrepant awareness, the audience, it is, a, is more attentive to the evil nature of the figure that is accompanying uh, Geraldine than Christabel is herself. So she's naive about it, and we, the reader, are less so, uh, largely because of the way in which Kohler is uh, giving us an account of the narrative. They pass the hall that echoes still, pass as lightly as you will. The brands were flat, the brands were dying, the brands in the fire, and amid their own white ashes lying. But when the lady passed, there came a tongue of light, a fit of flame. And Christabel saw the lady's eye, and nothing else she saw thereby, save the boss of the shield of Sir Leoline Tall, which hung in a murky old niche in the wall. Oh, softly tread, said Christabel, my father seldom sleepeth well. Sweet Christabel, her feet doth bear, and jealous of the listening air, they steal their way from stair to stair, now in glimmer and now in gloom. And now they pass the baron's room, as still as death, the stifled breath, and now have reached her chamber door, and now doth Geraldine press down the rushes of the chamber door. Floor. The moon shines dim in the open air, and not a moonbeam enters here. But they without its light can see the chamber carved so curiously, carved with figures, strange and sweet, all made out of the carver's brain for a lady's chamber meet. The lamp with twofold silver chain is fastened to an angel's feet. The silver lamp burns dead and dim, but Christabel the lamp will trim. She trimmed the lamp and made it bright and left it swinging to and fro while Geraldine, in wretched plight, 
sank down upon the floor below. The light of the lamp seems to suppress the, uh, at this point, uh, apparently evil figure of Geraldine. Uh, and the lamp uh, with its uh, swinging to and fro, something like a chasuble as well in, uh, in an Orthodox or, or a Catholic uh, service. Uh, uh, again, the, the light and the darkness motif being uh, evoked here. Uh, and, and of course, Christabel being a uh, sympathetic and sensitive young woman notes, Oh, weary lady Geraldine, I pray you drink this cordial wine. It is a wine of virtuous power. My mother made it of wild flowers. And in response to this, and will your mother pity me, who am a maiden most forlorn? Christabel answered, woe is me. She died the hour that I was born. I have heard the, gray the gray-haired friar tell how on her deathbed she did say, that she should hear the castle bell strike twelve upon my wedding day. O oh, mother dear, that thou wert here. I would, said Geraldine, she were. But soon with altered voice, said she. There's a bit of Smeagol and Gollum here, uh, the possessed woman. So the voice that says, I, were, I would that she were here, is of course the young woman who has been victimized. The woman who now speaks uh, is rather different and line in intent. And what does she say? But soon, with altered voice, said she, Off, wandering mother, peak and pine, I have power to bid thee flee. Alas, what ails poor Geraldine? Why stares she with unsettled eye? Can she the bodiless dead espy? And why with hollow voice cries she, Off, woman, off, this hour is mine. Though thou her guardian spirit be, Off, woman, off, tis given to me. So the uh, sense that Geraldine is here aware of a, of a tutelary spirit, the, the ghost of uh, Christabel's mother present there, guarding her daughter, and yet Geraldine uh, speaking to this spirit that, Christabel herself cannot speak, see, and announcing that uh, she uh, is now the uh, in control of the situation because she's passed over the threshold. And so, what we what what is slowly being brought to our attention is a uh, a pre-existing animosity between Geraldine and. Um, Crystal's family, in this case, her mother. Her mother died in the deathbed. By the way, it just occurred to me that uh, C.S. Lewis, in his um, uh, penultimate work in the Chronicles of Narnia, The Silver Chair, uh, uses this idea of the green lady uh, and the serpent uh, for his own work. So when I've said repeatedly that authors allude to other authors' work, that's clearly the case in the beginning of The Silver Chair. Um, if you are aware of that work, just, just think of that in the context of this work, and it becomes about clear that both the idea of a green lady and also of a serpent, who is the green lady, um, are, are being alluded to by Lewis, and he's thinking of Christabel. At any rate, so off woman oft is given to me, line 214. Then Christabel lent, knelt by the lady's side, and raised to heaven her eyes so blue. Alas, said she, this ghastly ride, dear lady, it hath wildered you. The lady wiped her moist, cold brow and faintly said, tis over now. Again, the wild, so there's some sort of a struggle, a spiritual struggle between uh, Christabel, or rather between Geraldine and the spirit of Christabel's mother that has taken place and it and it, it weakens Geraldine and Christabel once again has compassion but her compassion is her undoing she has sympathy for the power of evil that's in her presence and she is oblivious to it and again like Eve is oblivious to the presence of the evil of safe, Satan and is sympathetic to his arguments and his wiles and she is drawn uh, in uh, to closer proximity and yet here there's no 
evil act that she willfully transgresses. There's no prohibition of a forbidden fruit or anything like that. Nonetheless, there is an illicit action that will transpire, and we'll, we'll see that in a second. Uh, the cordial. Again, the wildflower wine she drank, her fair large eyes again glitter bright, and from the floor whereon she sank, the lofty lady stood upright. She was most beautiful to see, like a lady of far country. And thus the lofty lady spake, All they who live in the upper sky do love you, holy Christabel, and you love them. And for their sake, and for the good which me befell, even I, in my degree, will try, fair maiden, to requite, requite you well. But now, unrobe yourself, for I must pray, ere yet I, ere yet in bed I lie. Okay, so, the uh, what what's happening here? The lofty lady, namely, uh, Geraldine, who is now raised up and has drunk the wine, having overcome the uh, spiritual protection of her mother, and now appeals to the spirits of heaven at precisely the point in which she is going to work her evil upon uh, Christabel. And now she's called upon to unrobe herself. And what we have here is an, a, a, a clear allusion to a, a lesbian encounter between the two, I think. Now, unrobe yourself, for I must pray ere yet in bed I lie. So she wouldn't pray to the Virgin Mary before, but now she will pray uh, beside the bed, just like, and again, the, uh, the clear allusion to what happened at the outset of the passage when Christabel was praying by uh, the old oak tree and a moan came from the other side of the tree. Now, this lady, Geraldine, is praying by the side of the bed and inviting Christabel to unrobe herself, which she then does. Quoth Christabel, so let it be. And as the lady bade, did she, her gentle limbs did she undress and lay down in her loveness. But through her brain of weal and woe, so many thoughts moved to and fro, that vain it were her lids to close. So halfway from the bed, she rose, and on her elbow did recline to look at the Lady Geraldine. Beneath the lamp the lady bowed, and slowly rolled her eyes around, and drawing in her breath aloud, like one that shuddered, she unbound the cincture from beneath her breast, her silken robe and inner vest dropped to her feet, and full in view, behold, her bosom and half her side, a sight to dream of, not to tell. Oh, shield her, shield sweet Christabel. Again, the narrator uh, intrudes upon the description of the scene uh, to express his horror at what's about to transpire because she's not just dropped her clothes and revealed a beautiful woman figure, but something uh, rather more diabolical. Yet Geraldine not, nor speaks nor stirs. Ah, what a stricken look was hers. Now note this is the figure of evil here. She is stricken. There's a, and as I said at the outset, there's an element in which Geraldine is not just simply a uh, manipulator uh, trying to undo poor Christabel, but herself victimized and unwilling to do what she actually does. So we're sympathetic with the figure of evil that, e that Geraldine actually is, uh, as I say, a Lamia figure, half serpent, half woman. She has a stricken look, and deep from within, she seems halfway to lift some weight with sick assay, and eyes the maid, and seeks delay. So the resistance within her, just like Smeagol Gollum and Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. By the way, I think Tolkien is also aware of this scene, and the palfrey, and the, and the five riders, and so forth, pursuing uh, the ring, and so forth. That Again, authors read other authors and allude to them in their work if you read attentively and listen to what they're saying, even the language is often echoed. But she seeks delay, then suddenly, 260, as one defied, collects herself in scorn and pride and lay down by the maiden's side. Long dash. And in her arms the maid she took, ah, well a day. And with low voice and doleful look, these words did say, 
in the touch of this bosom there worketh a spell which is lord of thy utterance, Christabel. Thou knowest tonight, and wilt know tomorrow, this mark of my shame, this seal of my sorrow. But vainly thou warrest, for this is alone in thy power to declare that in the dim forest thou hearest a low moaning and foundst a bright lady surpassingly fair and didst bring her home with thee in love and in charity to shield her and shelter her from the damp air. So what has transpired? I, I've already alluded to the fact that there is a sexual, a less sexual uh, encounter here, but more than that, there's a clear possession going place because Christabel will have no memory of what has transpired other than that she met this woman uh, beside the uh, uh, oak tree and in uh, and in love and in charity uh, that she's brought her home. So she's also deceived and overcome. So it's a spiritual possession and an intellectual possession, a, uh, but, but most certainly a possession. So there's a sexual encounter, but there's also a spiritual and mental uh, overcoming of the Lady Christabel here. So horrifying stuff. Conclusion to part one. It was a lovely sight to see the Lady Christabel when she was praying at the old oak tree amid the jagged shadows of mossy leafless boughs, kneeling in the moonlight to make her gentle vows. Her slender palms together pressed, ha heaving sometimes on her breast, her face resigned to bliss or bale, her face, oh, call it fair, not pale, and both her blue eyes more bright than clear, about each about to have a tear. With open eyes, ah, woe is me, asleep and dreaming fearfully, fearfully dreaming, yet... I wis, dreaming that alone, which is, oh, sorrow and shame. Can this be she, the lady who knelt at the old oak tree? And lo, the worker of th these harms that holds the maiden in her arms seems to slumber still and mild as a mother with her child. A star hath set, a star hath risen, O oh, Geraldine since arms of thine have been the lovely lady's prison. O oh, Geraldine, one hour was thine. Thou had thy will, by tern and rill, the night birds all that hour were still, but now they are jubilant anew, from cliff and tower, to woo, to woo, to woo, to woo, from wood and fell. And see, the lady Christabel gathers herself from out of her trance. Her limbs relax, her countenance grows sad and soft. The smooth, thin lids close o'er her eyes, and tears she sheds. Large tears that leave the lashes bright. And oft the while she sm seems to smile as infants at a sudden light. Yea, she doth smile, and she doth weep like a youthful hermitess, beauteous in a wilderness, who praying always prays in sleep. And if she move unquietly, perchance, tis but the blood so free comes back and tingles in her feet. No doubt she hath a vision sweet. What if her guardian spirit twere? What if she knew her mother near? But this she knows, in joys and woes, that saints will aid if men will call, for the blue sky bends over all. Now, this is the passage, um, the part one, which was uh, written in 1797 before Coleridge uh, went on a uh, excursion to Germany, uh, largely aided by the money of the Wedgwoods uh, to develop his intellect. And, in, uh, and this is where he encountered the, uh, the higher uh, school of higher criticism of the German theologians there, uh, learned German, read uh, Kant and German, among other things, and we can see that influence in his later. Uh, and again, he doesn't conclude it, but uh, there's sufficient there for us to uh, meditate on. Uh, but you can see in that passage in the conclusion of part one, there's a sort of a strange conclusion because it doesn't seem to be a summary per se. Oh, it, it is to some degree a summary, but it's what has transpired here is that the it seems like the narrator is less dogmatic than we might expect about what has just happened. It is not, he does not seem to denounce the fact that evil has overcome good. He seems himself to have accepted that there's some sort of uh, goodness in Geraldine. Uh, and uh, and some, to some degree, the, 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 the narrator 
and his uh, moral compass are brought into question by his now uh, collusion with the scene. He's not denouncing it in the same terms that he did at the outset. And so that too is interesting because of course the narrator here is to some degree a reflection uh, of, of the reader and to some degree a reflection of, again, the romantic hermeneutics of uh, involving the reader in the action and breaking down the divide, not just between good and evil, but between the subject and the object or the audience and the uh, the actors. Uh, and and in this sense, the audience has come accept the evil that's happened and to some degree to become uh, not only um, uh, familiar with it, but complicit in it. Part two, at any rate. <clears throat> Uh, I'm not going to be able to read the entirety of that. I've just looked at the at the uh, at the time here, and we've got uh, hundred lines to read here, um, uh, as many as in the first. But I'll read some of it, and we'll get we'll get the gist of it. Uh, part two: Each matin bell, the Baron saith, knells us back to world of death. These words Sir Leoline first said when he rose and found his lady dead. These words Sir Leoline will say many a morn to his dying day. And hence the custom in law began that still at dawn the sacristan, who duly pulls the heavy bell, five and forty beads must tell between each stroke a warning knell, which not a soul can choose but hear from Braitha Head to Windermere. Saith Bracy the bard, so let it knell. And let the drowsy sacristan count slowly, still count as slowly as he can. There is no lack of such, I mean, as well fill up the space between in Langdale Pike and Witch's Lair and Dungeon Gill so foully tent with ropes of rock and bells of air. Three sinful sexton's ghosts are pent who all give back one after t'other the death note to their living brother and oft too by the knell offended just as their one, two, three is ended. The devil mocks the doleful tale with a merry peal from Bardale. These are all uh, uh, places in the, the, the northwest of England uh, that he is uh, referencing here. So the Lake District where his friend uh, Wordsworth uh, uh, resided. He'd met Wordsworth in 1795, by the way. Uh, and returned to that area when he returned back from, from Germany. Uh, the air is still through mist and cloud. That merry peal comes ringing loud, and Geraldine shakes off her dread. Note it's her dread. So we're back to the, uh, the woman who's been victimized as well as the victimizer, so we are feeling sympathy for her. But she shakes off her dread and lightly rise, rises lightly from the bed. She puts on her silken vestments, white and tricks her hair in lovely plight and nothing doubting of her spell awakens the lady christabel sleep you lady christabel i trust that you have rested well and christabel awake awoke and spied the same who lay down by her side long dot oh rather say the same whom she raised up beneath the old oak tree. Because, of course, as we saw last time, uh, Christabel has no memory of what's just transpired, or at least that's what we thought. We'll see that there is a conflict within her, an awareness, a discrepant awareness, a sense of possession, and there's a, a woman inside her that wants to, to cry out. But nonetheless, um, at this point, she awakens and she simply remembers that, oh, this is a lady I brought home from the encounter at the old oak tree. Nay, fairer yet, and yet more fair, for she belike hath drunken deep of all the blessedness of sleep. And while she spake, her looks, her air, such gentle thankfulness declare that, so it seemed, her girded vest grew tight beneath her heaving breasts. Sure, I have sinned, said Christabel. Now heaven be praised if all be well. And in low faltering to the first intimations on Christabel's part that something uh, wicked has transpired and she has no memory of it. But that's in her spirit. 
In low faltering tones yet sweet, did she the lofty lake with such perplexity of mind as dreams too lively leave behind. So quickly she rose, and quickly arrayed her way her maiden limbs, and having prayed that he who on the cross did groan might wash away her sins unknown. She forthwith led fair Geraldine to meet her sir, Sir Leoline. The lovely maid and the lady are pacing both unto the hall, and pacing on through page and groom, enter the baron's presence room. The baron rose, and while he pressed his gentle daughter to his breast, with cheerful wonder in his eyes, the lady Geraldine espies, and gave such welcome to the same as might beseem so bright a dame. But when he heard the lady's tale, and when she told her father's name, why waxed Sir Leoline so pale, murmuring o'er the name again, Lord Roland de Vaux of Triermain? Alas, they had been friends in youth, but whispering tongues can poison truth, and constancy lives in realms above, and life is thorny, and youth is vain, and to be wroth with one we love doth work like madness in the brain. And thus it chanted I divine with Roland and Sir Leoline, which spake words of high disdain insult to his heart's best brother. They parted, ne'er to meet again, but never either found another to free the hollow heart painting. They stood aloof, the scars remaining. Like cliffs which had been rent asunder, a dreary sea now flows between Long Dash. But neither heat nor frost nor thunder shall wholly do away, I ween, the marks of that which once hath been. So very interesting how Coleridge in, in his narrative keeps uh, introducing depth to the plot. Now we find not only that uh, uh, Christabel's mother died in child, which led Sir Leling to call that each matam there will be a, uh, the sacristan will pull the bell and, and um, announce that this is a world of death. So even who is living in mourning, there's a further cause of mourning, the breach that has happened between him and Sir Roland or Lord Roland, Bo of Triermain, his childhood friend. And that rift between two friends who were like brothers uh, further underlies the narrative. And what between them, so now the depth of, of evil seeps on, keeps on spiraling, spiraling outwards and also backwards in the of the actors here. And so now we find that what is the cause of an evil action here is the evil actions of the past in the same way we see uh, in the King where the actions of... Uh, Oedipus's parents led to his own terrible conduct and own terrible suffering in the same way we see uh, Coleridge exploring how evil often has causes that uh, extend backwards beyond the after evil themselves. And he says that there are scars there and they are marks that have not gone away. And the marks are twofold. One, he bears the scars, but two, he bears the amity towards his old friend, Sir Roland. And that is what motivates him here. So note once again, just like Christabel, who in her own good and compassionate uh, nature reached out to this evil figure, likewise Sir Lane here will have compassion towards this woman who actually means him and his daughter harm out of uh, love for his old friend. So this is how hideous evil is. It works under the uh, guise and the gaze and the perception of the uh, the good characters here. So, so Sir Leoline at a moment's pace stood gazing on the damsel's face and youthful lord of Triermain came back upon his heart again. So a friend that he thought was long lost is awoken, uh, awakened to him. He's lost his, his beloved wife and yet his friend has come back in the form of his daughter here. Oh, then the baron forgot his age, 
His noble heart swelled high with rage. He swore by the wounds in Jesus' side. He would proclaim it far and wide with trump and solemn heraldry. They who thus had wronged the dame were, were base as spotted infamy. And if they dare deny the same, my herald shall appoint a week and let the recreant traitor see my tourney court that there and then I may dislodge their reptile souls from the bodies and forms of men. Apt uh, and rather um, uh, uh, proleptic use language here, their reptile souls from their bodies and the forms of men. He spake his eye in lightning rolls, for the lady was ruthlessly seized, and he kenned in the beautiful lady the child of his friend. So he's going to avenge his dearly beloved old childhood friend's daughter on the infamy that was visited upon her frame by these nasty individuals. So she's told her tale and he has, he has fallen for the same trap that his daughter has. And now the tears were on his face and fondly in his arms, he took fair Geraldine. Note the references to embraces throughout. He takes her in his arms, who met the embrace, prolonging it with joyous look, which when they v she viewed, a vision fell upon the soul of Christabel. The vision of fear, the touch and pain. She shrunk and shuddered and saw again, oh, woe was me, was it for thee, thou gentle man? And she drew in her breath with a hissing sound, whereat the knight turned wildly round and nothing saw but his own sweet maid with eyes upraised as one that prayed. The touch, the sight had passed away, and in its dead that vision bled, which comforted her after rest, while in the lady's arms she lay, had put a rapture in her breast, and on her lips and o'er her eyes spread smiles like it. With new surprise, what ails then, my beloved child? The baron said, his daughter mild made answer. All will yet be well, I win. She had no power to tell aught else. So mighty was the spell. Yet he who saw this Geraldine deemed sure a thing divine. Such sorrow with such grace she blended as if she feared she had offended. Sweet Christabel, that, gently ma that gentle maid, and with such lowly tones she prayed she might be sent without delay home to other's mansion. Nay, nay, by my soul, said Leoline. Ho! Bracy the bar the charge be thine. Go thou with music sweet and, and take two steeds with trappings proud and take the youth whom thou lovest best to bear thy harp and learn thy song and clothe you both in solemn vest and over the mounts haste along lest wandering folk that are abroad detain you on the valley road. And when he has crossed the earthen flood by Mary Bard, he hastes, he hastes up Norrin Moor through Hall, Halegarth Wood and reaches in that castle good which stands and threatens Scotland wastes. Bard Bracy, Bard Bracy, your horses are fleet. Ye ride up the hall, your music so sweet, more loud than your horse's echoing feet. And loud, loud to Lord Roland call. Thy daughter is safe in Langdale Hall. Thy beautiful daughter is safe and free. Sir Leoline greets thee thus through me. He bids thee come without delay with all thy amorous array and take thy lovely daughter home. And he will be on the way with all his numerous array white with their panting palfrey foam. And by mine honor, I will say that I repent me of the day when I spake words of fierce disdain to Roland de Vaux of Trier. For since that evil hour hath flown, Many a sun hath shone, yet ne'er found I a friend again like Roland de Vaux of Tryermain. The lady fell and clasped his knees, her face upraised, her eyes o'erflowing, and Bracy replied with faltering voice, his gracious hill on all bestowing, Thy words, thou heir of Christabel, are sweeter than my harp can tell. Yet may I gain a boon of thee, this day my journey should not be. So strange a dream hath come to me, that I had vowed with music loud to clear yon wood from unblessed, warned by a vision in my rest. For in my sleep I saw that dove, 
gentle bird whom thou dost love, and calls by thy own daughter's name. Sir Leoline, I saw the same fluttering and uttering fearful moan among the green herbs in the forest alone, which when I saw and when I heard, I wondered what might ail the bird, for nothing near it could I see, say the grass and green herb beneath the old tree. And in my dream, methought I went to research out what might there be found and what the sweet bird's trouble meant, and that thus lay fluttering on the ground. I went and peered and could descry no cause for her distressful cry. Yet for her dear lady's sake, I stooped, methought, the dove to take, when, lo, I saw a bright green snake coiled around its wings and neck, green as the herbs on which it couched, close by the dove's its head it crouched, and with the dove it heaves and stirs, swelling its neck as she swelled hers. I woke. It was the midnight hour. The clock was echoing in the tower, but through my slumber was gone by this dream it could not pass away. It seemed live upon my eye. And thence I vowed this selfsame day with, with music strong and saintly song to wander through the forest bare, lest aught unholy loiter there. Thus Bracey said, the baron, the while half listening, heard him with a smile. So there's a, uh, a Cassandra type moment when a vision is given to Bracey the bard uh, of a warning about what has transpired and what has actually transpired, which is the overcoming of the of the bird by a green serpent who is underneath it in its neck. So there's a possession that's going on. And of course, Bracey is aware of this. So now note the layers in which evil and uh, good are being uh, presented together in various forms. Uh, the tale, the tale in others depth as we go along. Now I've uh, sort of run out of time here, but I'm going to conclude with a little bit of a look upon the references now to how Christabel herself becomes serpentine in, the, in this. We've already heard that she hissed uh, at the at sight of this uh, Christabel with her father. She, she hisses. So she now seems to be uh, not only overcome by evil, but herself to some degree to be uh, evil in the process. But Bracey says this, uh, he, 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 uh, or rather the Baron turns to her, uh, and says to her, sweet maid, Lord Roland's beauteous dove. Now he refers to her as the dove, misinterpreting the dream, misinterpreting and applying the dove to Geraldine rather than to his dearly beloved daughter. With arms more strong than harper song, thy sire and I will crush the snake. He kissed her forehead as she spake, and Geraldine in maiden wise, casting down her large bright eyes with blushing cheek and courtesy fine, she turned her from Sir Leoline, softly gathering up her train, that o'er her right arm fell again, and folded her arms upon her chest, and couched her head upon her breast, and looked askance at Christabel. Jesu, Maria, shield her well, note the long dash before it. A snake's small eye blinks dull and shy, and the lady's eyes, they shrunk in her head, each shrunk up to a serpent's eye, and with somewhat of malice and more of dread, at Christabel she looked askance. One moment, and the sight was fled, but Christabel, in dizzy trance, stumbling on the unsteady ground, shuddered aloud with a hissing sound, and Geraldine again turned around. And like a thing that sought relief, full of wonder and full of grief, she rolled her large eye divine wildly on Sir Leoline. The maid, alas, her thoughts are gone. She nothing sees, no bright but one. The maid, devoid of guile and sin, I know not how, in fearful wise, so deeply had she drunken in that look, those shrunken serpent eyes that all her features were resigned to the sole image in her mind and passively did imitate that look of dull and treacherous hate. And thus she stood in dizzy trance, still picturing that look askance with forced, unconscious sympathy full before her father's view, as far as such a look could be in eyes so innocent and blue. So at any rate, I, I'll, I'll, I, I want to conclude with that rather than completing the entire work. But uh, Sir Leoline looks askance upon his own daughter now and looks upon her with contempt, where, uh, whereas he ought to look upon her with sympathy. But he himself is being overcome by the wickedness uh, of the plot that has driven 
uh, Geraldine to overcome his daughter. It's now overcoming him, but rather to different wise. And so, so what we can see something like here is we have rather than a husband wife, we have a daughter and a father. So Eve has now fallen and now Adam is about to fall, but he falls in a different way. So again, there are allusions and echoes of the of the uh, account of the fall in Book Nine of Paradise Lost, uh, in uh, in Coleridge's account here, and that we can see uh, characteristically romantic aspects to it, which I think are in keeping with the uh, natural supernaturalism, which marks all of the romantic literature uh, in the period, and certainly on the course that we're looking at. Uh, we'll pick it up next time, and I shall see you then.